We could just go home right now, couldn't we? <laughs> what a great morning. I, seriously, here at Cibolo, there aren't many things better than getting to share in the celebration of baptism. You know, it's something really, really significant in the life of the person who's being baptized, but it also needs to be very, very significant in the life of the church. Because what it is, is evidence that God is at work in and through the church and what it's doing. There are people who come through our doors who don't know Christ as their savior. They don't understand that or they're not interested in that. And they keep coming back. And God, God works in their life. And they start, to, they start to make sense of some things and they oh, that's how that works. They come to faith. And then they declare publicly their decision to follow Christ. It, that's the Super Bowl for us. That's, that's the way that we had always prayed this church would work. And I want to tell you a little bit more about that today. So, um, oh, just such a great morning. I, I, <laughs> baptism and worship. Yes. Spencer closes with prayer. And my friend Corey says to me, she's coming after your job, Paul. <laughs> I'm like, have at it, girl. <laughs> now we're, we're honored to be led and worshiped by our team. Don't, you don't know the story, but, you know, Garrett's over here playing the guitar. He literally drove from Dallas to be here this morning. And he comes with a great heart. Just to say. <laughs> Garrett's been playing in this band since he was a kid awesome to see his commitment. Okay, so um, we, uh, we started a series three weeks ago entitled The Future is Bright. And, and we're talking about the future of Sybil Oak Creek Community Church. Here we are, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary and we're looking to the future and what God might have in store for us. And yes, we're talking about our church, but we're also talking about you as a follower of Christ because you are the church. And the promises that Christ made to the church, he makes to you as followers of Jesus. So we're exploring some of the promises that Jesus has made to the church, and I want you to understand how they might apply to your life specifically as, as a Christian. And so here's the premise that we're working from. The future is bright at Cibolo Creek Community Church if... If we remain committed to the values, the priorities, and the practices that God has promised to bless. If our church veers off course over time and we're no longer about the things that are valuable to God's heart and we're no longer about the priorities that Jesus established for his followers, if we're no longer committed to the purposes that God designed for the church, then we should not expect that he'll continue to bless our church. And that's very, very important to me as your pastor to, to make sure that we're all focused on what it is that Christ has instructed his church, Christians, to do. Does that make sense? So, Let's talk a little bit about Jesus. So there's some, a number of significant supernatural events surrounding the birth of Jesus. Virgin birth, declarations that he's God, come to earth, God with us. He's announced to be the savior of the world who will rescue human beings from the penalty of their sin. He's recognized to be the long-awaited Messiah. And from there, we don't know a lot about his childhood. We have one episode when he was about 12 years old. We read about something that happened then, but his his. his life as a child and his life as a teenager, we don't know a lot about. He comes on the scene publicly at around the age of 30. And that's where the Gospels really pick up the story, if you will. And he is, he is a rabbi. 
which is a spiritual leader in the Jewish community. Now, you have to know some things about rabbis. Uh, Rabbis were a little like rock stars in the sense that they had an enormous amount of influence. They were incredibly important people in Jewish society. They were usually the most intelligent people, and they were sort of the spiritual conscience of a Jewish community. Now, some things you need to understand about Jesus as a rabbi. He was not the only rabbi in his region. There would have been multiple rabbis, other rabbis, in the same way that there's multiple pastors just in this region. Now, I wouldn't equate pastors with rabbis. There's different in this, how they were esteemed by Jewish society. But there were other rabbis, and each of them had like their own unique personality. They had their own approach to understanding the Jewish scriptures and teaching them. They had their own kind of theological perspective. And they had a very specific way of life that they were attempting to live out their theology. But they were a big deal. They were respected and revered by the people in their community. Now, it was customary that a rabbi would recruit apprentices. And this, these apprentices were not chosen just to learn the rabbi's theology, but they were to learn the rabbi's way of life. Like how he went about living, how he related to his spouse, how he raised his kids, what he ate, when he ate, how much he ate, um, his daily practices and routines, the prayers that he prayed. From monumental to mundane habits of life, the apprentices were seeking to learn everything that they could in order to mimic the rabbi. Now... Let me tell you a little bit about Jewish school system. And I'm going to keep this very simplistic, not because you're simple. I just don't want to get bogged down in the details. Okay? There was essentially three levels of education. Every Jewish child started at around the age of six, went to about the age of 10, to what we would call an elementary school. They didn't call it elementary school. Um, and all boys and girls would come and they would learn kind of the basics of their Jewish faith and its practices. But this was an exceptional education. When a child finished the elementary age level of education, they had memorized the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Like that. They had memorized it. Now, when they finished elementary school, be nice, (laughs) not everybody continued. Young girls were not invited into the next level of education. A whole different period, a whole different culture. Just relax. I didn't make the rules, okay? Um, they They were encouraged to go home and learn the basics of keeping a house and raising a family and doing what Jewish women did in that society. Young boys who weren't invited to go to the next level because they didn't have the right stuff academically, they were encouraged to go home and learn their family business. So if their dad was a fisherman, they would come become fishermen. If their dad was a baker, they would learn to work in the bakery. If their parents raised sheep and goats and cows, they would become ranchers or farmers. And they would learn the trade of their family's name. Now, the best of the best would then move into a second level of education. But then there was a third and only the very best of the best, cream of the crop. The smartest among them were allowed or invited into the third level of education, which by the time that a student finished this third level of education, he had to, and it was only the guys, he had to memorize the entire Old Testament scriptures. Genesis to Malachi. And he had to be able to recite it at any point in the discussion. Somebody might say to him, what does the prophet Jeremiah say about this? 
They didn't have chapters at that point. They would introduce the topic and the young student would have to say, oh, this is what Jeremiah says in this particular passage. It's just astounding. Now, the young men who were invited into this third level of education, they generally had two ambitions. They were either going to be lawyers, not lawyers in the practice of law, but lawyers as an understanding of Jewish law, or they were aspiring to be rabbis. Because rabbis were a big deal. A lot of young men really wanted to live their life as a rabbi and assume that influence and that importance in society. But part of becoming a rabbi was to become an apprentice of a rabbi. And this was a really, really big social deal. And here's how it would work. As young men were nearing the completion of their third level of study, they would find a rabbi that they really liked, that they really admired. Like he was a cool teacher or he was really, really like wise in his theology, or they just liked his personality, or they liked sort of the following that he had, and they're like, I, I want to be with that guy. And so they would find their favorite rabbi, they would chase him down, sometimes they would do this as groups, and they would begin to engage the rabbi in this very scholastic, academic, heady kind of discussion. And the rabbi would begin to grill these apprentices and ask them all sorts of questions about Jewish faith and Jewish history and Jewish law and Jewish scriptures, trying to find the best of the best of the best that they would invite to become their apprentice. But it wasn't so much about just learning who could understand that rabbi's theology, which, you want to know something? I mean... (laughs) Work with me here. Do you want to know something? The collection of a rabbi's knowledge and practice, it was called, you ready? I love this kind of stuff. It was called his yoke. So when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, he's talking about take my teaching and my way of life onto your shoulders and now bear my life. And so these rabbis would grill these young apprentices and they would select a few of them to become his apprentices to not just learn his theology, but to learn his entire way of life so that they might in fact mimic him. In fact, the rabbi would choose his apprentices based on his confidence that this young man could not only understand what I teach, but he could live exactly as I live my life. Did you follow that? So the apprentices, they were called disciples. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who aligns themselves to a rabbi and begins to learn everything about the rabbi's way of life as he tried to integrate what he believed to be true with the way that he went about treating people and going about his day and doing the things that he believed were an expression of God's presence in his life. That's what a disciple is. So Christians, long before they were ever known as Christ ones, Christians were called disciples. Because our rabbi invited us to come and learn his way of life. Does that make sense? So, These disciples, they actually had a prayer that they shared among each other. And it went something like this. Now, this is debated historically. Like, was it really like this? There's evidence that it was, in fact. They had a a disciple's prayer. I love it. It was this. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Meaning, would you... We're praying that you would have the privilege of walking so closely behind your rabbi as you learn everything about the way that he lived his life, that as he kicked up dust, it would make its way onto your robes. And it gives us a bit of an understanding 
of just how closely the disciple was related to the rabbi by relationship and how much the, the, the disciple wanted to acquire an understanding of everything about his rabbi and the way that he lived his life. So, we come to the end of the life of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels before he returns to his father in heaven and he makes several very important statements. These are sort of like the very last things that Jesus said to his apprentices. And oftentimes the last things that are said are some of the most significant. And here's one of the things that Jesus said to his disciples, and it, re, it, it demonstrates this remarkable confidence that Jesus had in his young disciples to carry on his work. We always talk about our faith in Jesus, but we rarely talk about Jesus' faith in us. And yet look at this instruction that Jesus gives to his rabbis and the, uh, to his apprentices. And, and it's just imagine the amount of confidence that the savior of the world come to earth, the Messiah, would entrust the entire future of the program to these young disciples that he had apprenticed for three years. So look what he says to them. Jesus came to them, his disciples, and he said, this is after the resurrection, all authority in heaven and on earth, has been given to me. That's a big deal. I'm king. I'm boss. Therefore, I want you as disciples, I want you to go. I want you to move out into your region, out into your world. I want you to go, and I want you to do this. I want you to make disciples. I want you to repeat this process of getting to know someone and passing on what you know about your faith to them so that they can carry it on from there. Go and make other apprentices do this of all nations. And in the process of doing this, here's some things you'll do. You'll baptize them because they're not followers of Christ. They make a decision to become one of Jesus's apprentices. So you baptize them like we did this morning. People who had made a decision to follow Jesus. You baptize them, and Jesus' message was unique from other rabbis. You're going to be baptizing your followers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, an understanding of Trinity. And then here's what you're going to, you're going to teach them to obey everything that I commanded you. You're going to pass on, you're going to pay forward all the things that I told you about what it means to be my apprentice. You're going to pay that forward to some others. And surely, watch this, I am with you, how long? Always, like to the very end of the age of time. I will be with you. Now, I, I, think, I think this is, Jesus is not just speaking here. He's saying something very specific. And I, here's what I think it is. I'll be with you as long as you're busy making disciples. If you go veering off course and getting it to be about other stuff rather than the essential command that I'm giving you, then I won't be with you in the same way. And you go, wait a second, but I thought God was always with you. He is. As a son or a daughter of Christ, God is always with you. So I think that this must be something different. That God is saying that as you align your life to my purpose of making disciples, I'm going to be with you in a unique, powerful kind of way. I'm going to use you in ways that you could never imagine. I'm going to do something through your life that will give you a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction, meaning and purpose that nothing in all of life would even begin to compare to. I am going to be at work in and through you. I will be with you as long as you are occupied with making disciples. The church didn't exist yet. He is saying this to a group of followers of Christ. Like you and me. 
individuals who've made a decision to follow Christ. And he's given us a very clear instruction. Go and make disciples. Uh, Notice what Jesus doesn't say. Jesus doesn't say, love your neighbor. He doesn't say, serve those who need help. He doesn't say, be kind and compassionate. He doesn't say, go and be humble. He doesn't say, go and be a nice person. Why? Because all of that was contained in the instruction, teach them to observe all that I commanded you because Christ taught them to love their neighbor and to serve those in need and to be kind and compassionate and to be humble people, to be respectful and kind and considerate of others. Those are the teachings of Jesus. But the primary instruction is what? Go make disciples. That, that's very important. That's very important to me that we understand that. And here's why. I meet so many Christians. Are you ready? I meet so many Christians who say, well, I love my neighbor. I'm a good Christian. I, I'm, I, I, I serve, I volunteer, and I help around the community, and I do some things at church. I like to help people who have needs. And, you know, I like to think I'm pretty humble and I, you know, I don't brag and boast and I'm not arrogant about my faith. I kind of keep that quiet, but I, I'm a humble person. There's just one problem. That wasn't the command. The instruction of our savior was go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. So I have a question for all of us. I have a question for me and I have a question for you. You ready? Who are you helping become a disciple of Jesus? Who who are you helping to get to know Jesus a little bit better and to learn from you what it means to be one of his followers? Who are you having influence in their life Oftentimes we make following Jesus about us. I I go to church and I do my thing. I read my Bible. I do my thing. I say my prayers. I do my thing. I I help out now and then. I do my thing. Sometimes I put some money in the tray. I, I do my thing. But the question is, who are you discipling? Who's learning the Jesus way of life from you? I think the promise of God's power and presence in your life is as you make disciples. I will be with you always as long as you are baptizing and teaching people how to be followers of Jesus. Now, Jesus, he has a last instruction, a last, last instruction right before he returns to heaven. We read about it in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus says this, you will receive what? Oh power like I will be with you in a way that's different than me just watching out for you I'm going to bring a power into your life you will receive power when the spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses you're going to start in the town where we live in Jerusalem and then you're going to move out to the larger region and and then Samaria which was a little bit further than Judea and then you're going to take this message to the ends of the earth you're going to be a witness what's a witness do tells others about what they know what they've seen what they've heard can I get a witness A witness is a Christian who tells others about Jesus. That was one of his instructions. Go and be a witness. Being a witness is the first step. You ready? You ready listening? Being a witness is the first step to making disciples. If you want to be occupied around the purposes of Christ, of making disciples, the first step that you're going to take is being a witness to other people who don't know Jesus. We talk so much about worship. I love the topic of worship, right? So often we reduce worship to singing. 
The essence of worship is worth-ship. Worship is about demonstrating the value, the importance, the place of God in our life. And I don't think, I don't think, maybe you might think differently. I don't think there's a higher expression of worship than when we become concerned about a friend, a neighbor, a child, a a parent, a, a spouse, and their relationship with Jesus Christ because we believe that Jesus is so worth it that everybody needs to know about him. So I'll step up in courage and confidence and I will tell people about my faith in Jesus because he has so much worth. That's worship. At some point, we have to make the transition from making our faith all about ourselves and what we want and making our faith all about Jesus and what he wants. And what he wants is for us to make disciples and to be witnesses. I hear this all the time. Uh, Well, yeah, I don't talk politics or religion with my friends. I get that. But there's just one problem. We're really not talking about religion or politics. We're talking about life and death. We're talking about heaven and hell. Those are our friends and our family. And we have to ask ourselves, am I concerned enough? Am I concerned enough to tell them about Jesus? Okay, let me leave you with this. Jesus, master teacher, he tells these three stories back to back. Um, We don't see that very often. He usually tells a story. He tells three stories back to back. He's trying to help an audience understand a point. We're gonna go through this pretty quickly. You guys ready? I got got just a little bit more time left. You ready? Ready? Now the tax collectors and the sinners, uh, the bad guys, Tax collectors and sinners, they were all gathering around to hear Jesus. It's so fascinating. The people who were nothing like Jesus hung out with them. Uh, Gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees, that's the religious bigwigs, and the teachers of the law, these are the ones who graduated from the third level of education, they muttered, what's this man who says he's the Messiah, who's God come to earth, what's he doing welcoming sinners and he's having lunch with them? I thought he was supposed to be holy. What's he doing hanging around with people like that? And Jesus, he gets a drift of what's going on in their head and their heart. And so he goes, okay. And Jesus told him this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep, but you lose just the one sheep. Doesn't he leave the 99? I want to read this. I actually want to read this from your Bible. If you have your Bible, Luke chapter 15, he says, um, Jesus told him this parable, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together. He says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. And then Jesus says, what? No, listen, I tell you that in the same way, Just like that shepherd celebrates the the finding of that one lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and she loses one of them. She, She only has a few. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends, neighbors together. And she says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. Jesus, in the same way, just like that, in the same way, I tell you, there's more rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who comes to repentance. Jesus continued. There was a man. He had two sons. 
And the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So the father reluctantly divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and crammed it into a duffel bag and he set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth, his inheritance in wild living. And after he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be hungry and in need so he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs and he longed this young man he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating but no one gave him anything imagine that sitting on the fence looking down at what the pigs were eating and thinking oh what i wouldn't do for some of that that's hungry and when he came to his senses he came to his senses. He said, wait a second. How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And I'm starving to death? I know what I'll do. I'll set out. I'll go back to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to become your son, to be called your son. Make me just like one of your hired people. Just hire me out. So he got up and he went to his dad. I love this line. While well, he was still a long way off. Geographically, he was still a long way off. Spiritually, he was still far from his father. He was still a long way off. And his father saw him. Why? Because his father had been looking for him. His father saw him and he was filled with compassion. He wasn't mad. He was filled with compassion. And he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And he said, his son said to him, Dad, Dad, I, I've sinned against heaven and earth. He'd practice this, right? I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father interrupted him. He didn't even get to finish his speech. And the father said, wait a second, wait a second. Servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put the ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf. Let's have a barbecue would kill it let's have a feast and celebrate why because this son of mine was dead he's alive again he was lost and he's found and so they began to what celebrate, celebrate. he tells three stories each of the stories have three elements in common something was lost that which was lost was worth the effort to find it and when that which was lost was found a party was thrown one sheep one coin one son it teaches us a very important principle about the heart of God. And that is lost people matter. Lost people matter. And they've mattered in the life of this church for 25 years. And I believe that if we're going to have a bright future at Cibolo Creek, it will have to continue to be a value and a priority in the heartbeat of our church that lost people matter. But it has to matter to you because you're at the church. Your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your spouse, your kids, your aunts and uncles and grandparents, they have to matter to you about where they are in a relationship with Jesus Christ because you were commissioned by Christ to be a witness. So I have one question for us. It must become the heartbeat of our church. And it's this. Who's your one? Who is your one? Who does your heart break for? Who are you concerned about when it comes to the relationship with Jesus? Who do you wish, you wish with all of your heart that they would come to Christ? Who are you praying for regularly? Who are you intentionally pursuing with the hopes of introducing them to Jesus? Who is that for you? Who's your one? You say, I don't know how to introduce my friends to Christ. I have, I, have a, I have a really practical, helpful piece of advice. You ready? And we're done. The easiest way to introduce your friends to Jesus is to invite them to places where Jesus is. Let's start with your home. If Christ lives in you as a Christian, then he dwells in your home. Every time you invite a friend to be in your home, spend time with them, nurturing relationship, they are in the presence of a reflection of Jesus. How about your life group? 
Your life group in this church get together and Bible study and pray, but maybe sometimes you get together to just hang out and eat. Invite your friends, because Jesus is there. And I, I sure hope, I sure hope that we believe that when we gather together as the church on a Sunday morning, that Jesus is here. Jesus said, where two or three get together, I'm there in their midst. So one of the steps of doing what Jesus asked us to do in making disciples is to share our faith with our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, our relatives. And one of the ways that we can do that that's very effective is invite them to church with you. Invite them to lunch with you. Invite them to your life group. Develop the relationship with them that gives you the opportunity to introduce them to a discussion about Jesus as a witness of what he's done in your life. Does that make sense? Folks, that's really the heartbeat why we're excited about starting a second service. We're trying to make some more room for your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your relatives who need to meet Jesus. So on October the 2nd, we start a second service so that you, the church, can be witnesses and engage the people that you know in an invitation. Come, find out about Jesus. Does that make sense? You guys are awesome. Put up with me every Sunday. Let me ask you to stand together. Let me pray for you. I mean, we, come on. We've got some things to think about. We come here to do business. Has your faith become a selfish thing? Consumed only in you and your interest? Or do your, does your heart break for somebody else to know Christ? Imagine if this church got that. We, we couldn't host enough services. Father in heaven, we lift our hands as just some, some act of humility to say, we need your help. You've been so good to us. Your grace is outrageous toward us. Forgive me, Father, when I've, when I've become selfish with it and I've made it all about me. Meanwhile, I'm surrounded every day by people that need to understand your grace through Jesus. God, ignite a fire in our midst that everybody that calls this their church home will live with the question, who's my one? Who will I do whatever it takes to lovingly and kindly and patiently lead them to Jesus, a rabbi? Do that work in our midst, I pray and ask in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, if I've never met you, I'd love the opportunity. I will be over in that corner of the auditorium. I'd love to make your acquaintance. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.